today we are going to interview Gabriel. And before we start, I um, want to talk a little about uh, what does it mean to be a good interviewer. And to be a good interviewer actually isn't about asking a whole bunch of questions. It's actually about listening and being quiet. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see if I can do that. Uh, and the topic we want to talk about today is well, life at Stanford. But I've got to tell you, that's probably kind of a boring topic. Um, more interesting is what does success look like at Stanford? Um, and when you talk about success, you often want to know about failure. So the interview we want to put together, and we're going to kind of do this on the fly, uh, the explicit research agenda, the, the one I'm going to share with Gabriel here, is what is life at Stanford like? But for us, we're going to be listening for what is success at Stanford like? So that's, that's the implicit research agenda. Uh, and hopefully, we'll hear some interesting stories and things that will help us understand that really complex thing. So with that, we're going to meet Gabriel. So Gabriel, thank you for coming today. Uh, we are going to spend some time, probably 15, 20 minutes, um, and we want to get to know you. And in particular, we want to understand kind of what is life at Stanford like? Mm -hmm. Okay. So a um, <clears throat> couple things. Uh, you are the expert here. Okay. You are the one who went to Stanford and has had the experience. We are absolutely not here to judge. We are just here to understand how it kind of makes sense to you. Um, so with that, I'd love to turn it over to you and give us a little introduction. Um, who is Gabriel and, 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 and what do you do? What do you do? Sure. So, <clears throat> well, thank you for having me here, first of all. Um, I'm originally from Stockton, California. Um, I'm not sure if you have you heard of Stockton. I have. Okay. I what, have. what have you heard? Well, um, I've heard that it's kind of in the middle of California, and it's not yeah. the most prosperous place in the world. <laughs> yeah. In fact, uh, it's it's kind of a to be really not, not to give any offense, kind of a backwater. Yeah, yeah. So we're actually we've made a couple of lists, a couple of national lists. One is yeah. a, uh top 10 most miserable cities to live in Ooh. in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And the other was a uh, uh, highest crime rate per capita, which is funny because I didn't know that growing up in Stockton. I thought all of California was like that until mm. I moved out. Uh, I moved out when I was 21 and I came to San Jose to uh, go to San Jose State University. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I went to work um, at a media academy. And then from there, I, I came to Stanford for my um, master's degree in learning design and technology. And right now, I, um, I'm a lecturer in the School of Design and with the D-Life Lab, and I also run my own media company. It's called Conclave Concepts, and we do creative media. Fantastic. So, sounds like things are going pretty good. I'm curious, you started telling us about, you know, I, I came from a place that wasn't ranked so good. Compare that to where you ended up. What's the difference between where you grew up and, and where you now find yourself? <laughs> uh, I'm not even sure where to begin with that. <laughs> um, let me see. Well, uh, in Stockton, whew, uh, there's just a lot of attitude in Stockton. Um, you know, everything was about how you're perceived with your peers, um, if you're fearless or not, uh, how you conduct yourself. Um, um, in social settings and everything s seemed to be centered around uh, respect. Oh, you disrespected mm -hmm. me, I'm respecting you, whatever. It was just, it was just weird. And there wasn't a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of push for academics or anything. You know, mm. like the dreams back then were to uh, make it on your own, but whatever means necessary. Um, but it w wasn't necessarily through the educational route. Mm. Uh, with through degrees or whatnot, and um, it was rare for me to find somebody on the same wavelength as me. So uh, friends who um, were passionate about uh, going to school and finishing degrees, and uh, it was funny because my friends and I would hang out, and on the weekends we would go 
to parties all the time, you know, and social gatherings and hang out with friends and, and um, meet people. And sometimes I'd have to tell my friends, hey, I can't make it out tonight, guys. And like, why is that? I'm like, well, I have a test tomorrow or I have homework to do. Right. It was completely foreign to them. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Because I was in community college at the time. Yeah. And I remember com coming from Stockton to San Jose yeah. at a university. When I first stepped into, onto that campus, everybody, it seemed like everybody was on the same wavelength as I was. And everybody wow. understood, like, hey, yeah, we can go to this party. We got to pound these books out first. Yeah, yeah. we can go to this party. I got to knock this essay out first. Or like, yeah, we can go to that party, but I have to uh, finish this chapter in my book first or something like that. Yeah. And I was, it was the first time I was like, wow, I'm finally home. I finally made it to some place where people are like me. And when I came to Stanford, now I felt like I was you know, on the next level of, uh, not only have I found the people that are like me, right. but now here at Stanford, now I can find out what I'm about and who I am and how I can differentiate myself. Wow. from the people at San Jose State or whatnot. So you characterize Stockton a little bit. Uh -huh. You characterize Stanford. You said it's the le next level. Mm -hmm. Give me a little more. What is that? What is Whew. that? Okay, sure. So uh, for the longest, applying to Stanford, the only goal was to get to Stanford. <laughs> so when I got to Stanford, <laughs> I didn't know what to do anymore. <laughs> I was like, hey, all my effort, all my energy yeah, yeah. was, uh, you know, I put it all into my application and to get in Stanford, and I didn't think I was going to get in. Yeah. Um, matter of fact, I didn't even know that you were supposed to apply to several different um, graduate programs because mm -hmm. I, di I didn't know anything about it. You know, yeah. somebody just told me, hey, you should apply for this program, and I did it. Yeah. And I applied to one graduate program, one school, and I got in. So when I got here, I got the, the letter. I was like, we made it, guys. You know, I, I felt like I'm my everybody who knew me, my friends, my family, they all felt like they got into Stanford with me. Nice. We finally got in. Nice. And so I step off, I come to orientation. I'm like, okay, I'm here. And then I'm here with the reality, like, hey, I got to finish this program and I got to get a degree now. Yeah. What I do with that? So uh, it, was a, it was a learning process. I was wide open. I was wide open here. I was like, I have no expectations. You know, the fact that I'm here is, is a milestone in itself for me. It's an accomplishment that I'm proud of, but now what? And so I kind of gravitated towards what everybody, what I thought you should do when you go to Stanford. Mm. You, know, you go to Stanford, then what? Uh, I was like, well, I'm gonna go work for a place like Microsoft or Google or mm -hmm. Facebook or something yeah. cool like that, or yeah. Twitter, something yeah. like that. And uh, I remember, and I was, I was set on that. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna do it, it's gonna be amazing. And I remember one time I was talking to my colleagues on campus and, uh, they said, so Gabe, what are you going to do afterwards, man? I was like, oh, I'm going to go, you know, apply for Google or apply for Microsoft or something. And I said, um, what about you guys? Are you guys going to do the same thing? I was like, heck, nah, I'm not going to do that. And I was a little confused. I was like, what do you mean? What else is there to do other than go work for one of these top tech companies in Silicon Valley, you know? And they're like, why would I go work for one of those guys? They're like, uh, Google, founded here, Stanford. Instagram, founded here, Snapchat. It's built by undergrad for crying out loud. So why would I go work for a billionaire when I could be a billionaire myself? Wow. I'm going to start the new Google. I'm going to start the new uh, Twitter or the new Instagram. Wow. And when I heard that, it blew me away. Because in Stockton, people would say things to us like, you can do whatever you want as long as you put your mind to it. Mm -hmm. Or like, dream as big as you want. Follow amongst the stars. Shoot for the moon. Follow mm -hmm. amongst the stars. Mm -hmm. Stuff mm -hmm. like that. Now, we heard it, you know. But as we grew older... Like that, the value of those sayings and those phrases just, you know, lowered and lowered and lowered until it was just a whisper. You yeah. Know? yeah. Over here at Stanford, students walk around knowing that they can change the world. Why? Yeah. Because the people bef before them already have and are still doing it. And they know that they're next in line. Wow. So when I came to Stanford, I saw that I was part of this new culture, this new community, this fraternity yeah. of people who not only know that they're capable of literally changing the world, whether it's through business, education, medicine, technology, but they feel like they um, have a calling to do so. Yeah. When I learned that about myself, yep. like, hey, I could apply that to myself, just the way they see themselves like that, I could apply it to myself, all of a sudden, you know, I entered a new season in my life, I guess you could say. Fantastic. Time out. So... Gabriel has started us off on a fantastic interview. He is a delight. 
he's already launched into the meaning of what it is like to be at Stanford. He's, he's started to get into ideas of success. Um, Stockton is a really interesting starting point. So there are a whole bunch of places we could go from here. One important thing, though, is at this point, while Gabriel's saying really interesting things, we still don't know what kind of person he is and what kind of person he was in Stockton. And even though he's talked about Stanford, he hasn't talked about how he fits into Stanford. So those are the things we want to go to next. So, Gabriel, I want to touch base on Stockton one more time. Okay. Um, what kind of person were you in Stockton? <laughs> how would your friends have described you? Ah, uh, geez. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I, I was such a knucklehead back then. Really? Really? Yeah, I was a, uh, I'm a little embarrassed to say right now, but you know, it's just, we had, I mean, growing up, you, you had to be tough. Yeah, you had to have yeah, 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 yeah. And you would second guess yourself a lot. Like, am I as tough as the next guy? Right. So you would do things like a lot of insecure fellas do now. Yeah. Like they over, overcompensate or overshoot like mm -hmm. what they need to do in order yeah. to establish their, the alpha male role right. or the uh, oh I'm more you know I'm more crazier than you are this this and that yeah. and I got into a lot of trouble so I remember wow. you know even in elementary school yeah my friends were getting in fights and I hadn't gotten into a fight yet yeah. you know so I was in the fourth grade third grade right. fourth grade right. and there's like a rite of passage you get right. into a fight and get sent home yeah, yeah so yeah, I yeah. remember I just picked the guy and we're like hey what'd you say and he like I don't know what you're talking about bah! you know and then uh, yeah and that carried on to high school yeah and then later on even haunted me. Um, in my college years, even wow. to this day, you know, like I got into some trouble, had a little run in with the law, and yeah. it completely altered what I would say was um, my career, my future, my decisions, and everything like that. So um, you, you use the term knucklehead. Oh, yeah, yeah. What yeah. is that? What is that? What's a knucklehead? A knucklehead is somebody who's uh, disrespectful to authority, um, uh, reckless in decision making. Yeah. Um, adopts a I don't really care what happens to me mentality yeah um, for instance in high school I knew I was smart yeah but I would uh, intentionally not do um, the homework assignment right and right. I found out that I can ace all the tests yeah and not even come to class and still pass and so the 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 equations that I would learn in my calculus courses yeah. I would use those to figure out no <laughs> figure out my grade point averages yeah. and how many days I can miss and which assignments I can miss. And I just slid by with a B or Amazing. a C. Yeah. Amazing. And it was just funny because, um, you know, my, I was the first in my family to go to college. And my mom, she told me when I was younger, she says, three things I want from you. One of them is you got to get to college. We don't know how you're going to do it, but you got to yeah. get there. You're the yeah. oldest, make it happen. So, okay. So I got accepted into Sacramento State, San yeah. Diego State, yeah. uh, some other ones I forget, and I thought I was going yeah, yeah, <laughs> to yeah. uh, uh, college afterwards. And I got in, but I didn't apply for financial aid, for grants, for loans, or anything like that. And I remember my parent, my dad asked me, he's like, hey, so what are you going to do next year? You're in your senior year. And I'm like, I'm going to go to Sac State, I think, Sacramento State. So how are you going to pay for that? And I'm like, what do you mean? I thought you were going to pay for that. Weren't you putting some money aside? Didn't you want me to go to college? I'm, the holding, I'm holding up the end of my deal, aren't you going to? He's like, I'm not going to pay for you when you skipped half your senior year wow. and you had all these run-ins with your teachers, yada, yada, yada. And he's like, let me ask you something. What grade did you get in, I forget the, the class. It was some class. Like, what grade did you get in that class? So I got a D. He's like, that's right, D for Delta Community College, which you're going to go to next semester. So I did. Yeah, so anyway, wow. knucklehead the whole yeah. entire time. You know? But I, what I heard you say is that you were a knucklehead, but just want to make sure I heard this right, that being a knucklehead at Stockton was actually an okay thing with your friends. It was for my friends. It wasn't okay uh, with my family. Oh, they expected okay. more from, from me. So was it your family and that relationship that changed your sort of wanting to be a knucklehead? Sure. Well, looking back, I, I don't think I would be able to answer this question a few years ago or mm. during that time. But looking yeah. back, I was just trying to... I was just trying to survive in my environment, you know? Sure. That's sure. all I was just trying to do. I was yeah. always a good kid. I had yeah. good intentions. Yeah. But I thought I had to act a certain way to be accepted. 
yeah. by my friends. And it was always a struggle between being the good, the, the good kid with good grades and the cool kid that mm -hmm. hung out with the knuckleheads. Yeah, and yeah. I viewed, socially, I viewed myself as one of the cool kids sure. with, the knuckle, with the knuckle, as a knucklehead. Yeah. And then, but uh, academics, you know, like I was up there with the rest of them. Yeah. But because of my relationship with, with um, you know, the cool guys or the guys who didn't really care about school, my academic career suffered as well. For instance, yeah. I didn't get into the AP classes. Yeah. I was cutting courses. Um, I didn't do as well as I should have. So yeah. I put myself back a little bit, which I probably shouldn't have. So what changed your path from being a cool kid yeah. to so something else? There was, te there was tension with that. Um, you know, being cool and being a schoolboy. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was either one or the other yeah. in Stockton for me. And I didn't know any, I didn't know any other way. It was always an a inner battle. Yeah. Um, but I just, I just had this commitment to my, my mother. I told her I would get to college and I wanted to. I wanted to make my family proud. Yeah. So yeah. I just kind of hung on to that, you know, and yeah. I, it's kind of like having a, it was like carrying extra weight on your back. I, I did both, you yeah. know, um, uh -huh. but primarily I was, uh, I wanted to get to college okay. by any means necessary. And when I, community college wasn't easy because it was still in Stockton. Yeah. And yeah. most of my friends that went to community college with me were there, you know, uh, selling weed or checking out the girls yeah, or yeah. Uh, showing off their new clothes. Yeah. And then they would sign up for classes and they would last for about a week or two and then all drop off. And I would be like the last one. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I did yeah. that for two years. And it was like quicksand. But I tell you what, I got out and when I got to San Jose State, it was the first time that I saw the two, the two uh, conflicting worlds that I had merged together. Yeah. And I found like a whole tribe of people who are on that same page. Right. So I finally felt like I finally got in rhythm, in sync with my own self. And nice. I started to see what, what, what I could do with that. You know, now, it was an exciting time. I'm kind of curious, you used the phrase, some of the things you did still haunt you. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us what that means? Oh, yeah. So what I'm referring to is uh, when I was at San Jose State, I still had a lot of that Stockton mentality in me. Uh, for instance, I had a, a girlfriend at the time and she went to Monterey, the university in Monterey, and she told me that, you know, we were off and on, but she had told me that there was this other guy that was like getting into, uh, you know, like she was tr getting into her business and she was kind of talking to her at some point, but her and I were working things out. Yeah. And she was, he was kind of having a tough time let, letting go. Now, a mature adult would have been like, oh, let's talk to figure this out. But I said, oh, don't worry about that. I'll take care of that, you know? It was like a 21st birthday. And I don't know why, but at the time, I had a butterfly knife on me. You know what a butterfly knife is? Yeah, oh, sure. So, so you sure. like flip it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, they're super cool. They're also super illegal in yeah, California. Yeah, Anyway, uh, we went out there, and I started flaring my feathers, you know? <laughs> I saw this guy. He showed up to the party. I did this whole fiasco, and then... Before you know it, everything erupted. It was an all-out brawl wow. out there in Monterey. I completely ruined her birthday. Mm. Um, people swinging everywhere. You know, it was just something you would see in Stockton. Yeah. You know? Not not at the college level, but you, you would see that in Stockton. It was just horrible. Anyway, the cops showed up. Yeah. And what? Ah, <laughs> oh, Jesus. So here, here goes the knucklehead mentality. You're gonna you're gonna experience it firsthand with me here. My girlfriend and I, everybody spread like cockroaches when the cops yeah, showed up yeah. and we all take off different places. My girlfriend and I are walk at the time, my girlfriend and I are walking down the street going back to her house and she's in my ear and she's like, I can't believe you ruined my birthday. What's wrong with you? You're stupid, blah, blah, blah. The cops roll, roll by, yeah. cop car. And she's like, shut up, shut up. I'm like, okay. Cops roll by and I don't know why, but I'm staring at the cop like this all of a sudden my chest out, right? And, the cop, and we're in a cul-de-sac, right? So then the <laughs> cop rolls by. And then it turns around because it has to come back around. And then she's, and I remember she's like, you better not do anything stupid. I'm like, okay. The cop stops and rolls the window down and he leans his head out and he's like, hey, you guys looking for somebody? And then, you know, I could have, now this is where everything changed. I could have just said, no, no officer, thank you. And kept walking. But Stockton mentality, still with me, haven't shaken it off. Yeah. Look at him and said, nope. And then I turned and looked right at him and said, are you looking for somebody? Several seconds later, I'm cuffed up in the back because he found a butterfly knife on me, took me to jail. I'm in Salinas County uh, Jail now. 
and this is in the middle of finals week, or, right. you know, at San Jose State. And at that time, I wanted to be a youth correctional counselor. I got wow. bailed out. My, my dad didn't want to bail me out, but my mama did. Wow. And I'm happy to say that I paid that back. Several years later, I yeah. paid them the bail money, which was like $2,000 or something. Yeah. Um, that's a whole other story. Um, I get out, and I make amends with my girlfriend. And, you know, I'm upset with myself because I thought I had left that Stockton stuff behind. Yeah. Yeah. Now I have a criminal record, misdemeanor, yeah. violation of weapons, weapons violation. I didn't think much of it. I thought it was over. I didn't, it didn't come back to haunt me until a year later, I'm in, in my senior year, and I want to be a youth correctional counselor. I sent in all, all my applications, and as I'm about getting ready to graduate, I get these letters in the mail, one right after the other, and they say, thank you for your application. We're sorry to inform you that you're disqualified based on your criminal record. Mm. And they all came back, boom, 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 one right after the other. Wow. And it crushed me, you know? Yeah. I was already... I was 23, 22, and I had plans of getting a full-time job, making, you know, 80, 90,000 a year, maybe 100,000, uh, you know, get a wife, get some kids, get a house, and yep. coast out for the rest of my life. That was going to be my life, you know. And instead, I took the hard route where I was completely shut out of my only plan and I had to find another route for myself. Ultimately, thank God, it led to Stanford University yeah. and, and things that I'm doing now. But that was a dark time in my life. So I say it still haunts me because I don't know what could have been. I try not to think about it. But, um, I, you know, just that little mentality came back. You so know? in that moment when you told the cop, are you looking? Are you looking? How, how did you feel? What was going on inside? I was, well, yeah. I, was, I was angry. Well, I was angry. I was, yeah. What I was most angry about was I was... I was angry because I had this attitude with the cops that they seem to never be there when you need them the most, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and we weren't treated really, in Stockton I had some experiences with cops that, you know, they just didn't really, they never seemed like they were on our side for yeah. anything, you know? Yeah. And I, what I was most angry about was that he, and he was a, a, a Latino cop, yeah, yeah. you know, like me. And, yeah. and I just felt like, Man, we're supposed to be. I told. I, I told him when he had me in the back of the cop car. I told him. I said, you know what? You you know what the bad guys look like, man. Why are you? Why do you have me cuffed up here? I'm like, you saw my San Jose State University ID. You know, I wasn't brandishing my knife or nothing. I just had it with me, and I told you that I had it with me because you asked me because he had to frisk me yeah. and he asked me if I had any sharp eyes. I was like, I didn't have to tell you that. And he goes on this whole rant about. And I just had so much like resentment and anger for this. Uh, personal authority that I couldn't do anything about. Yeah. But when I asked him, are you looking for somebody? I was, I just, I don't know, the way he said it, you know, he said, are you looking for somebody? Kind of saying like, what, what are you doing out here? You got no business out here and whatever. Yeah. I'm like, well, what does it look like we're doing, man? This is still campus. It's still campus. You know, yeah. this is U Monterey University campus. Yeah. Like, we, we, who do you think we are? We're, we're students. Yeah, we might have gotten a scuffle back there, but we're still students, man. Like, yeah. we're doing, we're, well, aren't we on the same side? You know, like you're trying to get kids off the street and have them do something productive with themselves. We're kids off the street doing something productive with ourselves who just got into yeah. a little scuffle. Like, so what was he really telling you? He was, he gave me the message that I was just receiving my, my entire life, I guess, then, you know, yeah. in school. In high school, when the AP teacher's saying, no, you, you don't qualify for this class as AP English, and all that bullshit, sorry. Yeah. You yeah. know, he's, just, he's playing into those same people, you know, saying that you don't, you don't belong in here. You don't yeah. belong here. You don't, yeah. you're not university material. Yeah. You're, yeah. Not, you're not Stanford material. Yeah. You're not San Jose State material. Yeah. You're, um, you you don't speak like the educated. You don't dress like the educated. You don't come from education. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. All that stuff people tell me. In his room, I never thought about it until he brought it up. But when he said, "Are you looking for somebody?" It's like like I'm lost. Like I don't know where I'm at. You know? Like I don't know what I'm doing. I'm like, yeah. hey man, I'm just trying to get by, just like you. I'm trying to protect myself. I'm like you over here walking around with a gun. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You're protecting. You're not protecting myself too. Wow. Yeah, wow. I guess I never looked at it like that, but I guess that's what he did tell me. That's yeah. what he really si did say to me. Like, you ain't, you ain't shit. Yeah. So, there have been some changes. 
Cool. Okay, there's some changes. <laughs> there have been. So yeah. it sounds like that was a kind of a low point for you. Yeah. That was kind of a low point. Yeah. So tell me about Stanford and some high points. Sure. So 2008, I graduated from San Jose State. I had a criminal record. Yep. On top of that, was the first time I ever felt uh, severe and true heartbreak. Mm. The same girlfriend I was with, I found out she was doing bad things, you know. Oh, no. She was being disloyal. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. And it was the worst time of my life. Yeah. You know? And in my family, if you're, you know, like once you leave the house, you don't come back unless it's on good terms. Got it. You don't come back because you're broke. Yeah. You better go find yeah. yourself a job. Yeah. You know? yeah. So I graduated. I have no money. I have a criminal record, and I'm completely heartbroken because I found some stuff, you know. So what, what do you do, you know? Yeah. So I felt like I had my back up against the wall. Yeah. And I guess this is when that Stockton mentality did serve me. Mm. Because when you have your back up against yeah. the wall, yeah. you don't lie down. You better knuckle up. Yeah. You, know, you yeah. go down fighting. Yeah. If you're yeah. going to go down, you better get a couple good ones in. Nice. You know? yeah. So that's what I did. I just started swinging. Um, I took a job at the Redwood City Boys and Girls Club as an after-school mentor, which is ironic because yeah. the state of California will not hire me because I have a weapons violation, but a nonprofit organization that works with little kids yeah, will yeah. hire me yeah. with yeah. a weapons violation. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. And I actually did that because my fraternity brother's little brother, yeah. his name was Ivan, oh. and um, he worked at the Redwood City Boys and Girls Club and he got me a job there. And nice. Ivan is this monster audio producer. Oh. And when I began working over there, I started being introduced into a world of media. And one day I go to my supervisor and I say, I wanted to ask for the, a day off or something. And I, I'm like, hey, where's Pete at? You know, Peter Pitt was my supervisor. Yeah. And they say, oh, he's in the media lab. My media, we have a media lab? <laughs> like, yeah, he's in the media lab. Go to the door. Sorry. Yeah. So I go to the media lab. And I'm like, hey, what's up, man? And he's like sitting down at a computer. And then I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just editing this video. And I'm like, what do you mean editing a video? And he's like, you know, like putting, making a video. I'm like, well, what is that, that? What's that program called? And he says, Premiere Pro. I'm like, well, what is that? He's like, yeah. video editing software. You know, he's asking, answering my questions like matter of factly. Yeah, yeah. And I say, um, wait a minute. I'm like, where'd you get that footage from? And he points to his camcorder. He's yeah. on the side. Yeah. And I say, time out, man. I'm like, are you telling me that you can film something and you could take that footage and you could put it into the computer? Nice. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, mind blown, right? I don't know anything. I'm not a technical guy. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wait. And in that program, can you put footage in there? Can you cut it up like a puzzle and then put it all together? He's like, yep. Yeah. And I said, can you put music in there? He's like, mm-hmm. I said, can you make music videos with that? He's like, yeah. And I gotta tell you, like if you ever had a light bulb go off in your life, this was it for me. Wow. When I found out that I had access to that, you know, I didn't even know if that's how video editing was done. Yep. I thought video editing was you had two film reels, yeah, yeah. And you had to cut it and tape it. You know, I thought it was all in a dark room or something like that. Yeah. So when I found that out, you know, I had nothing to lose. This is the only like glimmer of hope I've seen in a long time yeah. after being broken hearted, have a yeah. criminal record, no money. Yeah. And I dedicated all my time to this new craft and he gave me some sample footage, and I can't explain it, but I just got it. Yeah. I understood. I'm yep. like, give me two hours of footage, I'm gonna make some. I'm gonna make a masterpiece in two minutes. So when that light bulb went off, what what were you feeling inside? I felt uh, it was hope. It was warmth. It was excitement. Yeah. It was the best way I could describe it. Is at that point in my life, it felt like everything was black and white. I could only see black and white. And when I learned about this new opportunity, it's like my whole world burst into colors, wow. vibrant colors, where now all of a sudden anything is possible again, you know? And from there, I've, I've directed and edited uh, music videos in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles. I ended up on MTV Jams, yeah. BET. I became the director of the Peapod Adobe Youth Voices Media Academy, which is a partnership between Adobe and the Black Eyed Peas. Yeah. Um, and then from there sprouted another opportunity to go back to school, which is Stanford University. And I got to tell you, when I got to Stanford University, that letter, oh, geez, it meant it went way more than getting a degree here. It meant the 
the shame and embarrassment that I had on the phone call, the yeah. call from jail to my yeah. mom and my dad, yeah. the uh, everything that I've messed up in my life, you yeah. know, like all those things. It felt like I finally made up. For, I was always trying to catch up, but when I got into Stanford, it felt like it catapulted me, catapulted me forward. Like not only did I catch up, yeah. but I'm now I'm ahead of the game, yeah. you know. So when I called my mom, my dad, my family, everybody was like, "Wow!" Just blown away, you know. And I fought for so long, years, to dig myself out of the 2008 hole that I put myself in. It was like three years, you know, fighting depression, fighting suffocation, fighting sure. loneliness, fighting. Uh, Am I worth anything? Was that cop right? You yeah. know, were those people yeah. right? And now all of a sudden, to me, Stanford University was like somebody putting a crown on your head, you know? And when it's funny because when I got here, I still had all that with me yeah. for at yeah. least like four or five months, yeah. you know? And I yeah. was in a 12 month program and I still carried that with me. And people would look at me like there was something wrong with me, you know? Because they, they knew they were gonna come to Stanford. They were choosing between Stanford and Oxford and yeah. Harvard yeah. and, Yale and whatever, yeah. but me, you know, this was, it just meant so much more to me. And um, I think they could see that because I brought that excitement with me into my classes and stuff. And they actually, uh, a quick side note, they actually voted me to be the flag bearer yeah. at graduation yeah. for, my, for my program because they knew how excited I was to be a Stanford student. Um, so, well, you got me on a rant. Yeah, I did, yeah. I did. <laughs> The question that, that, that came to me is having come to this place and even with all the Stockton spirit, it must have been intimidating. And how did you manage that? And certainly all of us who come here, it's, it's pretty intimidating. Even yeah. the people who got set up, you arrive here and whatever you thought you knew or however good you thought you were, it's intimidating. Yeah. How did you handle that intimidation? Sure. Uh, yeah, so when I got here, there was definitely the notion or the feeling of they made a mistake or maybe I don't yeah. belong here or mm. I don't I don't speak like them. Yeah. I'm not as articulate as they are. I'm not as intelligent as they are. I'm not as knowledgeable as they are. It seems like they know way more about, um, you know, the subjects that we're studying than I do. Um, what I struggle with, and I, I feel everybody, everybody uh, has some sense of that. You know, it feels that at some point here at Stanford because the truth is, you, there's geniuses here. There's, mm -hmm. there's brilliant minds, Jimmy Neutrons all yeah. over the place, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is good, which is good, you know? It reminds me of the saying, somebody said, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. <laughs> Get the hell out of there, you know what I'm saying? For real. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so yeah, I, knew yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. I knew I was yeah. in the right place. I knew I was in the right place. I didn't take it for granted. Yeah. Um, but there's, there's actually something that I, I learned here that helps me to this day in my business, um, in my relationships, everything. Um, I tried so hard when I was here to change who I was. Mm. I tried to sound like I was smarter than I was. I tried to listen to different types of music, watch different types of shows, subscribe to different magazines, mm -hmm. um, dress differently. Mm -hmm. You know, learn learning about wines and cheeses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but what I was most insecure about was the way I speak, because yeah. no matter how hard I try to mask it, it seems like my the slang that I developed or that I grew up with really, sure. really my first language. You yeah. know, it, in Stockton, you know, just the relaxed nonchalant just you know we, the slang I, I'm a fan of slang you know not too crazy but you know and there's a little uh there a twang yeah twang in my voice I, I guess love you could it. say yeah love it <laughs> and I would try to change it or mask it mm. but I realized that that part of me is what sets me apart from everybody else and in the right setting that could be a huge advantage you know, because I'm just not like every other Stanford student, every other grad student, every other lecturer, yeah. every other yeah. CEO or founder of his startup. You know, yeah. this yeah. is yeah. what I've learned is that it has helped me establish almost immediate rapport with people because I don't have defenses up. I'm like, hey, yeah. boom, this is what you get. If you like it, good. If you don't, I'll keep moving. You yeah. Know yeah. Yeah. And I think people can trust me because of that, because I show a little bit of 
It's a little bit of vulnerability yeah. because, you know, I wasn't sure if that was okay, an okay aspect right. or part right. about me. But it's also, it shows that I'm willing to put myself out there and people trust that and they see authenticity. So yeah. my, what I would say to anybody here at Stanford is, you got here because you were who you were, not because you were trying to be somebody else. So nice. how does it make any sense to try to change who you are now that you're here? Yeah. You know, it's been working for you so far that you, you're Stanford, you made it to Stanford, keep rolling with it and um, figure out how you can use what makes you unique nice. to your advantage. I, I, that is a fantastic both piece of advice and I think a way to wrap up this interview. Um, All right, I think we're set. I, I think we're good. I think we're good. Cool. That, hey, thank you, man. Yeah. Thank you. That was that was real.